Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Home Daily for October 8th, 2018. On today's episode, we're going to talk about what we've been up to at the water cooler. This is Slash Home Editor-in-Chief Peter Soretta. Joining me on today's podcast is Slash Home Managing Editor Jacob Hall. Hello, hello. Weekend Editor Brad Oman. Hey, that's me. Senior Writer Ben Pearson. Hey, what's going on? And Writers Kwai Chen Bui. Hey, everyone. And Chris Evangelista. Hello. Guys, we have a full team again. Uh, there's been a lot of traveling going on, which we'll talk about in a moment. But I am so happy to have both Ben and HT back here and uh, hear your voices. Uh, we, we missed you with all this uh, nonsense that has been going on the past <laughs> two weeks. We're really happy to be back for the Same. most part. Um, before we get into today's episode, I, I did want to say I, I got this email from uh, Daniel N. Um, last week, I think I mentioned that uh, I was praising the excellent work of the sound designer of First Man, and I think I said that he will probably win an Oscar. Apparently, it is not a man. It is a woman named Ai Ling Li. So, uh, yeah, I just didn't... Um, I had not even looked up the name, so it, that's just my ignorance for, uh, you know, <laughs> giving, uh, just addressing it as a uh, he, she, whatever. Uh, anyways, uh, let's move on to the water cooler and talk about what we've been doing. Uh, ben, you've been on a huge trip for the last two weeks. Uh, tell us all about it. Yeah, so I'm actually only going to tell you about half of it now, and then I'll save half of it for next week, because otherwise it would just be me talking for like two straight hours or something, (laughs) because this trip that I went on was totally insane. My wife and I went to Iceland and Ireland, um, and also Northern Ireland, which is a separate country, Uh, but I'll just talk about the Iceland part um, now, and I'll sort of give you guys like as quickly as I can, because I know this can kind of get um, absurd uh, very quickly. Uh, I'll give you like a whirlwind rundown of some of the things that we did and saw there. So our first ben, night, we've just been yes. sitting here looking at Twitter and being depressed. So, uh, <laughs> you know, tell us all about it. We want to hear about it. Okay, so the first night we actually got to see the uh, Northern Lights, which was something that my wife was particularly interested in, and we had our fingers crossed. You know, it's all based on the weather, like what time of year it's best for uh, people to be able to see the Northern Lights. Obviously, you have to be, you know, pretty far north on the globe to see them. And we, you know, had our fingers crossed that we were going to be able to check them out. And actually, we saw it just that one night as we were, like, out walking around the streets of Reykjavik. And uh, it was pretty awesome. I mean, I'd never seen it before. Um, She had never either. And I've seen all sorts of crazy pictures and stuff online. And um, it was pretty magical, guys. I don't know. Has anybody else here ever seen the Northern Lights? When I was very young, I lived in Alaska, but it's more of a dream than an actual memory. Oh, man, that's a whole nother story. I had no idea you lived in Alaska. I'll have to talk to you about that at some point uh, (laughs) offline. But, um, yeah, so that we started off on on that note, which was pretty great. Uh, We went to a bunch of national parks and did a a few little hikes where the weather there is just totally nuts, where it changes sort of at the snap of your fingers. Like, it was cool and, and brisk outside, and all of a sudden it turned into... Uh, a hailstorm and snow was coming down at like a 45 <laughs> degree angle. And then all of a sudden it was completely sunny again, like 20, 30 minutes later. So um, it, it's pretty wild how I think like one of the, the national catchphrases or one of the phrases that everybody always says and is printed everywhere is like, if you don't like the weather, just wait five minutes. And that's their, one of the the sayings in Iceland, I guess. Uh, and that definitely held true for our visit because it was, it was all over the place, but really, really great. And um, especially coming out of what had been sort of a, a hot streak in Los Angeles. It was nice to be in some cooler weather. Um, so we, uh, we saw geysers, we saw waterfalls, we went snowmobiling on a glacier that was pretty awesome um the the <laughs> snow was so bad that visibility was probably i don't know 20 feet tops and the guides that were giving us the ride basically uh told us that this this was like the ping pong ball effect because you get the sense that you're inside of a ping pong ball because th- there's whiteness on the ground and then the snow and the weather, you know, and the sky is so intense that it's basically the same color white. So you start to lose track of your <laughs> boundaries and your, your, uh, you know, your bearings very quickly. And they were like, if you get lost, 
just stay put because we have GPS trackers and we can come find you. But we have to like radio the main city, which is, you know, uh, whatever, 100 miles away and then wait for them to respond and then come out and get you. So I was very worried about wow. because the weather was so intense. I was very worried about getting lost and left behind and, you know, out in the middle of a, a glacier when we had no food and no water or anything like that, because uh, you had to take this huge, long bus ride to get out onto the glacier. And you're it's very isolated out there. Um, but yeah, it was it was pretty amazing as well. Uh, and Wait, then, were you at all nervous that you were going to hit anything because you can't see what's coming? Not really, because it was all it, it's all flat and and icy out there. So I, I wasn't worried about like running into anything other than the other people on the tour. So <laughs> we uh, like my I was driving and my wife was behind me on the same snowmobile. But as we were riding around, there were probably I don't know eight or nine other people on other snowmobiles on the same tour with us, and like four or five of them flipped over and crashed, and like they were going nuts. So and I I thought it was pretty easy to drive the snowmobile. But I don't know. I guess the weather got to these people and they hit a bank or something. And uh, yeah, they, we had to stop a bunch of times to sort of <laughs> like watch these people pick themselves up and brush themselves off and get back on the snowmobile. So uh, I guess the good news is that we weren't going that fast. It was we we're probably going like 30 miles an hour or something. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess there, there weren't any serious injuries. <laughs> so that was good. Uh, we visited Black Sand Beaches, which was an amazing thing to see. I brought my drone out there. And we got, I hope, some really, really cool drone footage. I only, like, I haven't even, I've been home for such a short time that I haven't even had time to offload all of my photos and, like, take a look at the stuff uh, up close and, and check it out. But um, I'm, I'm really excited to dive into that in the coming days and, and check that out. Uh, we visited a plane crash site and got to, like, walk around in the fuselage of this plane that crashed years and years ago. And it was just abandoned on this Iceland, uh, Icelandic beach. And uh, there were rainbows everywhere. I mean, guys, it was it was a magical experience. Uh, we got to walk behind waterfalls. It was, like, everything that you could possibly imagine in terms of, like, a fairy tale uh, <laughs> vacation to a, a an exotic foreign country that has like you know all sorts of hiking spots and and really um, like it, it was like a photographer's dream basically. Ben, why are you describing the first ten minutes of the found footage horror movie? When do people start dying? <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily we got out of there before any death occurred. <laughs> Um, you usually put together like these fantastic, like videos of your vacations, like, and it's not like, uh, typical when people put together a vacation video where it's like, uh, insufferable. It's usually right, right. like a very, like, not, not a huge length and it's like the best of, and it's like yes. very cinematic and stuff. So how long does that take you to put together after like a trip like this? Oh, man, it's going to be a long time because we got so much footage. So my wife and I both had our phones and then we had a GoPro. Oh, actually, we had two GoPros and we had a drone as well. So, it, I mean, it's a lot of stuff that we I, I think we have combined probably, I don't know, close to 5000 videos or something from uh, <laughs> wow. of the entire trip. So it's going to take a long time to sort of categorize all of that and go through. I'm I'm guessing that will be done because we're probably, we're probably going to split it up into an Iceland video and then an Ireland, Northern Ireland video. So I'm guessing the Iceland one will be done in like five or six months or something. Like, That's I don't a know. a lot of equipment to lug around too. Like it I, is. I took my DSLR around uh, Thailand and I started to feel like it was too heavy, but you yeah. guys have like five cameras. Yeah. And we had, we had a DSLR as well. We have a Canon 6D. Um, so that was, yeah. In addition to all the video stuff, that was like our photography camera. Um, so yeah, it, that's, that's one of the downsides is like, you have to pack all of that stuff and be ready, you know, have it in a backpack and easily accessible whenever you're doing anything. Um, and, you know, we have like all the clamps and grips and different sorts of uh, mounts and stuff that you can use in certain <laughs> times. So we have to bring all of that too. So it, it's like, it can be sort of a headache, but I think ultimately, you know, years from now, when we look back on the footage that we got in the, in the video and stuff that we'll eventually make, uh, it will all have been worth it. I hope. See, see, my big problem is when I intend to videotape stuff like this, like a vacation, I just get so into the vacation and, like, having fun that I I forget to actually capture the moments. 
Yeah, so. yeah. It can, you know, it's a, it's definitely a balance. There are times when you have to just like remember to put the camera down and live in the moment and experience the thing instead of experiencing it, you know, for the future and just, you know, be there at, at the time. Um, but I think, I think we struck a, a pretty good balance um, of, of, yeah, capturing stuff and trying to make it as cinematic as possible. So we'll see. I'll, I'll let you guys know how, the, how that progress is coming along, and uh, I'll, I'll be sure to share the video once it's done. Well, Ben, we're we're glad to have you back. And uh, have you read any of the news? Don't read any of the news. Just just uh, don't read. You know, yeah. That's the thing is, like, I was gone for two weeks, and I didn't check Twitter pretty much uh, the entire time, and it was glorious. And then coming back, like, I, I think I got back Saturday night, and I looked at Twitter for the first time yesterday, and I was like, oh god. And I could, <laughs> it's almost like you could feel the biology changing in your body like the chemistry changing yeah. in your body to like be more depressed because of all the garbage that's happening in the world but anyway okay continue um ht was gone last week she was uh on a work trip is that what we yes. can say H-T? okay we can say it's a work trip <laughs> a work trip to new <laughs> zealand uh but it wasn't all work you got to experience some some cool stuff right Outside of uh, yeah. the stuff that we cannot talk about yet. <laughs> yeah, speaking of um, magical lands, I got to visit Middle Earth, although not uh, exactly Hobbiton, which they do have in uh, Auck- near Auckland in New Zealand. But uh, we stayed in Queenstown, which is in the South Islands, and it is just a gorgeous place like everywhere you step there is like stepping into a postcard uh so queenstown is actually uh, a ski resort made mostly for people who to stay during the the winter vacations and this was actually the spring uh, in new zealand when we came there so we had come right after this huge rainstorm and all the snow had melted away uh but we still got to do a lot of the fun touristy activities around there uh and a lot more than we usually get to do on these kind of work trips too which is really exciting so um uh, the first day we tried the famous Ferg burger there, which is the kind of local novelty burgers that this that Queenstown is famous for. There's nothing really special about it except for the fact that it's uh, made from, you know, homegrown New Zealand beef and it's about the size of my head. <laughs> uh, I did finish it all in one go. I felt sick for about three hours afterwards, but I did it and I'm very <laughs> proud of myself. <laughs> that place is awesome. I went in 2016, uh, and Ferg Burger was great. We, my wife and I, both love that place. It's so good. I we they have both. They have a bakery there too, like attached to the burger store. Um, and we went there in the mornings for some for breakfast, like meat pies that they have, which is a famous, uh, which is this common New Zealand breakfast. So I, I had a lot of meat while I was in New Zealand. Um, yeah, the burgers are delicious. I'm, I feel like I'm underselling it, but they're really good. And um, the line stretched for like two blocks because this place is just so famous. So that was a lot of fun. And uh, it's just um, a really beautiful scenic place. There's snow-capped mountains everywhere. Um, we also went up the Skyline Gondola, which is a... Uh, where people usually go to ski during the winter but we went up to just see the view and also ride the luge which is a sort of sled that you can um control and there's like little sort of track that you can take down the mountain and it's a little bit frightening to see at first because it looks quite steep but once you get the hang of it you're actually you know you feel like you're an olympic luge rider or something although i was passed by several children and old people <laughs> all down, along the way down <laughs> wait is that one but, of those uh, ones where you like put down the brake and there's like it, like it's like kind of sparks and stuff yeah yeah i mean like if you're going fast i wasn't yeah. going that fast i was going at a very <laughs> sluggish pace obviously it <laughs> but feels it like lot... mario kart doesn't it it she? does it's kind of like taking like bumper cars like down a mountain and uh people are passing you and you can steer a little bit it's a little bit like that um except it's kind of a sled meets a bumper car kind of thing it was a lot of fun and um going there up the gondola was just gorgeous because you see uh like the beautiful skyline of queenstown which is surrounding a lake and the the skies were just incredibly clear and blue the air was pristine i felt like i could breathe for the first time in years um and then we also the um on our last day there we got to go to a little tour around an area called paradise which is uh, a 
so a location where they filmed several films, uh, including the famous Lord of the Rings. And of course, since the, New Zealand is best known for Lord of the Rings uh, filming locations, the cars, the jeeps that we were in had little license plates uh, named after various Lord of the Rings characters. I went in the Toriel car, but there was a Boromir uh, car. And um, they, at, at one point, after taking us through several places, such as where they filmed Isengard and... Um, other locations, I can't remember the exact places. Uh, they took us to this beautiful creek and let us take pictures with sto- with sword replicas uh, from the studio, as, lo- as well as cloaks. They knew what we were there for. So <laughs> I have a really dorky picture of me in a cloak posing with a sword. And um, it's a- it was so much fun. It's a beautiful tour. They also filmed other films such as Wolverine Origins and uh, Chronicles of Narnia and even Mission Impossible Fallout most recently. So it's a beautiful place. A lot of baby sheep just wandering around, a baby lamb, and um, it's it's very scenic. I recommend it uh, entirely. I'm so happy I got to do so many things despite being there for work, but I'm really eager to to go back again. <laughs> yeah, this is really rare. Usually when we go on these uh, work trips, we're in the day before the thing we're doing and we're leaving like the next morning after and like you really get a chance to go out to like – a restaurant and <laughs> walk around and that's that's about it um but uh you can check out some photos of both ht and ben's trips on their instagrams both of them looked uh you know everywhere you guys were looked like you know postcards like <laughs> looked amazing um but uh let's move on to jacob who finally got to try the void star wars uh vr experience what is it called shadows of the empire i think uh, Star Wars Secrets of the Empire. Oh, Secrets of the Empire. Uh, yeah, uh, Peter's talked about this before, so I'll, I'll give the briefest of recaps. But uh, the Void team, the Void, which is a VR company, teamed up with uh, uh, Lucasfilm X Labs for this VR experience. And if you're thinking this is the thing where you sit there with a thing on your head and something and stuff happens to you, it's a lot more intense than that. You put on a full VR headset. You put on a, a, a chest piece. That has like motion sensors and triggers on it, so you can and you go through a series of rooms, but the VR paints them more or less, so you feel like you're walking through a Star Wars adventure instead of a series of blank rooms. So you can touch walls or ground beneath your feet. You are moving around. You are handling a blaster. You're shooting stormtroopers. You're walking through doorways. You're interacting with your environment. But if you took your VR headset off, you would just see a bunch of blank rooms uh, with some occasional props, whereas the VR paints in everything. And the rooms add heat. They add smell. They add uh, floor vibrations. It's it's really remarkable technology. And I'm writing a full piece about this for Slash Film. I even interviewed the uh, CCO for The Void earlier today. And he discussed with me about how this is not video games and it is not movies. It is its own new entertainment medium. It exists in its own place and deserves to be seen as a burgeoning new form of entertainment as opposed to a spinoff from something else. And it's genuinely remarkable how much fun I had with this. It takes place before uh, Rogue One, Cassie and Andor gives you your mission, and your K2SO is out there with you. <laughs> Wait, what? How did that happen? Yeah, how did the, uh, Siri is, is interrupting this podcast <laughs> on a regular basis at this point. I sat on my phone and, and CR, Siri recorded my entire conversation and tried. <laughs> okay, but yeah, um, Secrets of the Empire, it, it's a really cool thing. It's only 20 minutes long, so I don't want to spoil it. Uh, but I I walked away a true believer in what The Void is selling here and these new experiences that are just creating its own new medium. And the reason why I'm doing this and the reason why I, w- I went out for this for work is that The Void has struck a deal with Cinemark Theatres – uh, whereas before you have to go to big tourist cities like uh, Disneyland in Anaheim, Orlando with Walt Disney World, or uh, Las Vegas to see the Void, uh, the Void is being brought to Cinemark theaters and their did and their and their uh, flagship location in Plano, Texas, which is right outside of Dallas, about three and a half hour drive from where I am in Austin. It's my, it's my wife's family's go to theater. I've been there <laughs> many times, and in the over the past uh, six months or so, they transformed the corner a corner of the theater lobby into a new the Void location. And the plan is to, if this works out, you don't have to like go to a special place to experience the void. You can go to your local theater or your local cinema, in this case, pay the admission fee, and go live a Star Wars adventure. It is generally an exciting concept. The idea that um, democratization is kind of this kind of um, uh, 
entertainment, the idea that anybody can do this in any city, you know, Plano, Texas, which which is, you know, not right next to a major city, but still, Plano, Texas has the void now, and that's really cool. Uh, I'm very excited for people to be able to see this. I'm very excited for them to do more. I'm not sure if this is news, but uh, in our interview, the CCO did talk about that they have a Wreck-It Ralph experience coming soon. Uh, they have a Marvel one planned for next year. Uh, so, and they've had a, a Ghostbusters one in the past. Yeah. So I think we're going to start seeing all these, you know, major properties being given this immersive experience, and I'm I'm thrilled <laughs> that people are going to have a chance to try this out, and we'll have to make a major vacation in order to do so. Yeah, I'm I'm really wondering how that's going to work out. Like, do they use the same exact space with the same exact walls and stuff for the different experiences? Did you get any indication? Uh, uh, I asked I asked about this. And he was cagey about it, and I, <laughs> I don't blame him. Um, but I know that when I was on on the void, I was trying to absorb as much of the room as possible while I was not in the headset. So after and before, I was sort of like looking around. I noticed a, a security screen that had like an overhead grid of this of the rooms in the, in the void experience itself, and there were only five or six rooms. It's uh, very small. Yeah. So the idea is that since you, since you you since you're, they're painting in different passageways and rerouting you around, you're circling through the same spaces multiple times, but they look completely different. You're not aware of it. So I think that with that in mind, they could easily just uh, redraw more or less a new experience on top of these same rooms. Maybe carve in a new door, move a wall or two. But I think the uh, idea. I'm I'm excited to see if if they can do like hey on Tuesdays and Thursdays come do Star Wars on Mondays and Wednesdays come do Marvel if, if that will be the future here or if there'll be one experience at a time, but uh, or if you or, can, you or know, even mid- multiple experiences in one day. I, I yeah, exactly. That, that would be possible. Yeah, um, menu option like you, you go in there and say I want to do this one. Okay, the next slot for that one is twelve forty five. Come back then. You know, I can imagine it being something like that. But it's I know Peter, you, you did this before, and I want to know like months later has it has it stuck with you the same way it's sticking with me a week later. It has like it. It really feels like you are inside the world, the the, the Star Wars galaxy, like in in a way that it's hard to describe. Because I've talked to the about this to friend a lot of friends, and everybody's like, "Yeah, I've done VR," and I'm like, "No, no, no you haven't done this." Like it, it, literally, there's a point where there's you know blasters in the wall, and you pick them up, and it's like in your hand. In, in the oh no, it, it's just it's so, and I, I know even that sounds stupid, but uh, when you're in it, it just feels so like you're transportive, yeah, yeah, immersive. Um, I'm excited. I'm excited. I, I I hope that like with these Star Wars things that they do like uh, more episodes of it, so you could go back like every couple months and like find out what happens from there. And uh, do stuff like that. Uh, I I do feel like it is a little bit uh, generation one or two, um, not not in a bad way, but I feel like there are moments in this thing where like someone has to solve a puzzle, and I feel like that the puzzle is kind of very rudimentary. And I I would love for like those things to be like uh, you have a whole team of people that are storm you know dressed as stormtroopers like infiltrating the space, and it would be cool if like the people could work together like you know you have to like you know get certain bricks from like one area of the room to another area do you know what i mean like in a more physical way i think uh i think we're gonna see that though i think yeah. it, when we get to generation five of this it's gonna be like insane it's i'll insane. say this much uh, i did solo uh i would ride that time when nobody else was in line uh so i do the, the puzzle solving by myself and while the puzzles are very simple Having K2SO uh, yell at you that you're doing the puzzle wrong <laughs> because you're trying to do the puzzle while fighting the stormtroopers who are storming the door, that was, like, tense. I was sweating like crazy because I was trying to do both at the same time, and K2SO was so mad at me. I can't even <laughs> imagine doing this by myself. <laughs> the cool thing is when you do it with other people, Jacob, I'm not sure you, you, it sounds like you didn't get to experience this, but, like, you actually see your friends, like, as stormtroopers in that world. And, like, yeah, they, I, like, I, I didn't get a chance to see that. I was, I was solo, but I heard that's what happened. Yeah, and you, you can actually, like, you know, high-five them, and it, 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 it's, it's totally – it tracks everything. It's pretty cool. Um, but we, we got to move on. We have a lot of stuff to talk about today. Let's, let's move on, move on to what we've been reading. Ben, what have you been reading? 
Yeah, so uh, as I was preparing for this trip, I wanted a book for the plane, and I wanted to read an adventure story. And I was at a, a used bookstore, and I was like trying to figure out what I wanted to read. And I was like, man, I kind of want something like The Princess Bride. And I actually found a copy of <laughs> William Goldman's The Princess Bride while I was there. So obviously I bought that, and I read it. And that was the first time I'd read the book. I, I love the movie. Um, and the book is fantastic. It came out in 1973. It is uh, basically everything that happens in the movie happens in the book and it's it's a pretty uh, spot on adaptation and but there, there are things in the book that um that make it like a, a different experience and i would highly recommend reading it for anybody who loves the movie because it gives you more uh, backstory into uh indigo montoya and fezic and um it, it it there are different aspects of the story that are <laughs> as you read it it sounds like unfilmable so it's very obvious why they <laughs> didn't do it like there's a part where uh prince humperdinck has what he calls the zoo of death which is like this uh five or six layer um <laughs> like a section of the castle where he because he's a he's a, a famous hunter he uh, has trapped all of these deadly animals and and put them in these different layers uh, of this zoo of death. And at a certain point, uh, Fezzik and Inigo have to go through, make their way through these different layers to get to uh, Wesley at, at, a, at a certain point, like near the end of the book. And it's very obvious because there are all these like giant snakes and like crazy creatures and stuff that they have to face off against. Um, and it, it reads really, really well, but it would be very difficult on to film, uh, very expensive to film, certainly. So um, and obviously, like, the, I don't know if you guys know the the conceit of the book, but William Goldman uh, presents it as like an abridged version of S. Morgenstern's classic. And there is no S. Morgenstern. He made up that person. So the entire thing is is really William Goldman. Goldman's, uh, you know, it comes from his mind uh, only, but um, it's really entertaining to read his sort of asides uh, explaining. It, it, it's basically like the the framing device in the movie with Fred Savage and um, Peter Falk's characters. Uh, that is all basically done in written form with Goldman sort of um, addressing the audience, addressing the readers uh, instead. So, yeah, it's a great book and I would highly recommend it to anybody. Very cool. Jacob, what have you been reading? I read a George R. R. Martin's Night Flyers because it's being adapted into a uh, TV series on sci-fi. And I love George R. R. Martin's work. Uh, his Song of Ice and Fire novels are very important to me. And sci-fi has been killing it recently. I mean, they canceled The Expanse, uh, but Channel Zero is the best horror show on TV. And I feel like they're backing a lot of really cool, interesting genre shows. So I want to prepare myself. And Night Flyers is a novella published in 1980. And I read the uh, relatively recent hardcover re-release of it which packages it with illustrations, and it's a bit lavish for what's essentially a one-sit read. But it's a really cool little book or novella, and I have no idea how it's going to be a TV show. When we saw footage at Comic-Con, uh, and the trailer's been released online, what we saw was nothing like the book. There's, other than the very basic premise, there's so little in common that I feel like they saw George R. R. Martin's name, science fiction, Let's run with this because <laughs> Game of Thrones creator uh, having a new TV show uh, is a golden opportunity to make some money. But um, I say that without trying to be too cynical because the show looks really cool and the book is really fun. Basic premise of both is a ship called the Night Flyer is recruited to go investigate an alien signal uh, floating in the galaxy. And a group of scholars and academics all get on board the ship, start heading for it, and bad stuff starts happening. Bad, evil, horrible things. It's very much like Event Horizon, if you've ever seen that movie. Lots of um, combination of actual horror tropes, like actual haunted house vibes with science fiction. And even though the TV show looks very different and the uh, book has a very definitive ending <laughs> and does not allow for much expansion without massive changes, I they both really hit the right um itch for me i really enjoy the mixture of science fiction and classic horror and if you like alien if you like event horizon if you like doesn't want a space odyssey there's a little bit of all of that in there and the world building isn't maybe as solid as a song of ice and fire george r. r martin's much younger it's 16 years before the first game of thrones book but i enjoyed it a lot and it's and you can probably find a much cheaper copy if you don't want to spring for the illustrated hardcover but it is really fun and if you want to get ready for the show it's a it's very simple homework. You can read in two hours max. Uh, but in addition to uh, books, I wanted to 
shout out to two titles in my comic stack that, from that I'm catching up with this week. The first one is uh, Image Comics Sleepless, which returned from a short hiatus with issue number seven. This is created by writer Sarah Vaughn and artist uh, Leela Del Duca. And this is a really wonderful comic series. And I want to put it on the radar of everyone, but especially HT. HT, you need to read Sleepless. You're going to love this. It, it is the uh, halfway point between The Princess Bride and Game of Thrones. It is very charming, female-forward, uh, uh, intrigue fantasy set in the court of, of a king. And his niece is the lead character who may or may not be targeted for assassination as she tries to navigate uh, both the actual dangerous world of being a royalty while also being a teenager and developing friendships and falling in love with her bodyguard. And it is so cute and sweet while also having just enough threat to be like, if we take it seriously, I am just so utterly charmed by it. The world is so much fun. The characters are great. And this is the work of uh, the, the artist, Lila Del, Del Duca. Um, she, she's a black woman and there aren't a lot of black female artists working in mainstream comics. And the lead character is made me realize, oh, I'd never see black women leading fantasy comics. And it's little details like the fact that she wears a hair wrapped to bed. And so that made me realize that there's so many other voices out there who aren't getting the, these chances and aren't, allow, aren't allowed to um, tell these stories. And as a white man, I'm so happy to like read a character who's, who's by her very nature in, so different than most protagonists, male or female, in fantasy comics. It is, it, it is something special. Uh, and seven issues in, like I said, things, things could go wrong. It could get canceled. Um, it could take a downward turn, but I am on board for the long run. This is my with uh, saga S- saga taking a year off. Uh, this is gonna be my new favorite comic, my, the comic that I recommend passionately to people who want something new and fresh in comics. Uh, but stepping away from new and fresh to stinking and rotting, I want to talk <laughs> about The Walking Dead. Uh, and I say that with love because The Walking Dead is as good as it's ever been. Now there was a couple years there where it was hit and miss, but. Even as the show seems to be kind of waning and kind of on its last legs, the past year or so I've seen this uh, comic really find its feet again. It really is less about fighting zombies and more about re- reestablishing civilization. The current story arc is that Rick and his group essentially uh, realize other parts of the country have essentially rebuilt to the point where there are cities full of people with jobs and careers, and they just kind of try to exist and live normal lives with the zombie threat on the outside. And the recent stuff is very zombie light, very heavy on how do you rebuild after the world falls apart. And I'm really enjoying it. And I'm curious to see if the show catches up here, if they can make it as compelling. But yeah, if you want a um, new comic, Sleepless. If you want an old comic that's once again good, Walking Dead. I didn't think there was any way that you'd convince me to want to read The Walking Dead again. But uh, your your pitch has me interested. Um, HD, I know... You were a little bit nervous of doing this long flight. Uh, how long was your flight to New Zealand? It actually wasn't that bad. My I flew first to L.A., which is about five hours, and then to New Zealand from there was 12 hours, which is definitely not one of the worst flights I've had. Actually, I think <laughs> I flew to Hawaii earlier this year, and I think that flight was actually more punishing despite being around the same time. W- were you um, reading anything on the flight? I did read a thing on the flight. So I finished reading Pachinko, which was really good. I, I kind of said everything I've had to say about it. It's a great multi-generational story. It deals with um, an immigrant perspective that you don't usually get to see, which is uh, Koreans uh, moving over to Japan and the racial tensions that develop there. And um, I finished, I started reading The Alienist, which is um, the, the novel of the TNT series that I really enjoy, despite a reviewer not really liking it. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed the alienist, so I was excited to read the book, and it's really good. Um, it's written by uh, da, 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 oh, Caleb Carr, and uh, it was published in 1994. And it's written from a focal character uh, narrator. So uh, basically, it's a second narrator who is not the protagonist, and is kind of describing the um, the adventures and. Um, and misadventures of the main protagonist. Uh, so in in the show, this uh, focal character is played by Luke Evans in kind of a um, against type casting, which is really interesting because he usually plays the leads in these type of um, series, but in the sense he was a supporting character. And he felt kind of 
tertiary in the series. I was kind of wondered why he was there, except in the end when he became part of the trio between uh, Dakota Fanning and Daniel Brühl's character. But in the book, it makes a lot of sense because he is the focal character through which we learn uh, about the character of... Um, Dr. Uh, Laszlo Chrysler, who is this uh, alienist, which is another word for um, a psychologist. In the early 1900s, uh, people with mental illnesses were deemed uh, as being alienated from their true identities, and thus people who treated them were known as alienists. And uh, in this fictional um, crime drama, uh, Laszlo Chrysler is kind of the first like police profiler who goes after the serial killer and has the uh, wild notion of going after the serial killer by looking into his motivation and his and his uh, origins and his backstory and seeing how that motivates him to do these killings. So um, in this, uh, it's told through the point of view of John Moore, who is a newspaper um, reporter in the book and illustrator in the TV series to give him something to do. But he just kind of uh, is telling the story of this really graphic, brutal serial killings that's happening in New York, um, 1896 New York, actually, uh, of, of the serial killer who is targeting young boys who work at brothels. And um, Laszlo Chrysler goes after them and they kind of so form this sort of uh, unofficial detective team that consults with police it's great it's very gothic which i liked um you kind of get a little bit less of that in the tv show but it comes in full force in the novel uh i'm really enjoying it i like how seedy and um intriguing and dark it is uh, i think that it has a level of camp in the tv series that that kind of comes out because of the film but not so much in the in the book which um it's a kind of more straightforward crime drama but i really enjoy it it reminds me a lot of 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 gothic novels i've enjoyed like frankenstein and even rebecca to an extent very cool uh well it is Th over 35 minutes into this podcast we have not talked about movies or tv so this one's <laughs> gonna go long guys just uh to warn you but let's get started uh last week i saw the press screening of venom uh i'll keep it short because i if you go to the slash film cast which should be up probably by the time you're hearing this you can hear me join the gang and uh review this film and a star is born so you can hear my extended thoughts there but uh basically i was expecting what i was expecting from venom and no if you've listened to this podcast for any amount of time you know that i was expecting very little from venom i i was kind of surprised that it was better than i thought it was going to be and uh and by that i mean it's still a very bad movie but it wasn't as bad as I think the trailers made it out to be. I, I, I think uh, this might be the best bad movie of 2018. I know Jacob's going to disagree with me here. But I, I, I kind of enjoyed what uh, what uh, Hardy does as Venom and the kind of conflict. And I, I know that in my screening, there's probably two dozen laughs that were probably at unintentional spaces in the film. And I strangely had fun even though it's a very very bad movie uh but uh jacob you also saw this film oh i did uh it is almost worth seeing because tom hardy is making choices he is trying his all i heard somebody say he plays eddie brock as if he's jim carrey in the 90s i think he's more like bobcat goldthwait in the late 80s but he's definitely <laughs> making some some choices and i'm glad he i'm glad he does because the rest of the movie is not making choices the rest of the movie is such a drudge it is trying to um hit what sony clearly thinks people want out of a superhero movie while not understanding it at all it was written by committee it is oh, it wastes michelle williams it wastes riz ahmed it is full of logical problems like things that normally i'm not a nitpicker for plot holes but there's stuff in the movie that flat out doesn't not make sense and uh i am <laughs> when I, I was mostly bored by it i think that's just this really messy really sloppy movie that only its last five minutes uh finds what it should have been if the first if the last five minutes had been the first five minutes i think we could have been talking about a pretty good movie here uh but when the YouTube compilation hits of Tom Hardy doing his best scenes in Venom, you should watch that and bookmark it because he's a treasure and I love Tom Hardy and he's doing he's doing everything he possibly can to make this work. But the movie is just just a tragic bore and 
there is, I'm not going to spoil it, but there is a mid credit scene featuring a character with a wig that is in the running for worst wig of 2018. I can't get it all out of my mind. Every single time someone talks to me about Venom, I mention the wig. And when we eventually do a year uh, and wrap up stuff here in Slash Film, I guarantee you I'll find an excuse to write about that wig as being one of the best worst moments of the year, even though the rest of the movie I don't think quite lives up to that. That scene feels like a credit scene that was made before the Marvel Cinematic Universe even existed. Yes. <laughs> uh, actually, the whole movie does, in a way. And, uh, you know, it, it's produced by Avi Arad, who was a, uh Israeli-American toy designer. He si- somehow uh, failed his way up to being <laughs> uh, in charge of Marvel <laughs> Studio or Marvel Comics. And uh, at the time, he wanted to stop production of the comic books and just sell toys. Of the uh, when, when this is when Marvel was doing bad, so that shows you how what kind of person this is. He's the guy that was, was responsible for Venom and Spider Man Three. He's the guy that's responsible for the Amazing Spider Man movies and how badly they are. I think, uh, and he's also if you've seen the two cuts of Daredevil, the theatrical cut and the director's cut, he is largely responsible for the theatrical cut. Not to say that the director's cut is a better film, but. Uh, but I do th- I do agree with you. It, it, it is a lot of like bad stuff, and I think it's. I hate to always. I hate whenever someone credits someone for this, but I I think it's obvious, Rod. If you ask me, Brad, you also saw this movie. What did you think? Knock knock. Let the devil in. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh... I. <laughs> This this movie really is not good. Um, I it, what's interesting is like I didn't find myself hating it because like like a lot of people, there is something that's entertaining and fascinating about it, and a lot of it has to do with Tom Hardy. And, and specifically, what I found myself drawn to and constantly paying close attention to was the physicality of his performance. Because as much as he's definitely hamming it up and overperforming. There's something really cool that he's doing and that's impressive as an actor with his body, especially during I really noticed it during the fight scene in the apartment um, when he really sees the full breadth of like the abilities that Venom gives him. And as his body is moving around and fighting all of like the Life Foundation, you know, SWAT team or whatever you want to call them, that's trying to stop him. He's doing these these action sequences where he's punching and kicking, whatever, throwing himself around. But, like, the look on his face is one of, like, confusion <laughs> and perplexion. And, like, he just, he does such a good job of making it believable. And uh, there, there's there's something almost classic about, the like, the comedy in his performance. The whole Jekyll uh, and Hyde kind of conceit of this film is I, – I, I, I think it's kind of clever. It, it's – I mean, I don't know if it's clever, but it's, it's, it's interesting seeing Tom Hardy do that. Yeah. Otherwise, the rest of the movie, it's just it's, – it's humdrum, paint-by-numbers, comic book action, the – the CGI fight sequences between Venom and Riot are like indistinguishable, and there's there's nothing special about, you know, any of the comic book parts of this movie. But if there was a movie that was a little bit more dark and more, uh, you know, straightforward, funny, with uh, Tom Hardy as Eddie Brock and and Venom, I would be much more interested in seeing that if if they want to go for gold with the, with the sequel because. Um, I didn't hate that part of it, but the otherwise, you know, this movie is totally forgettable. Brad, did you see Upgrade? I haven't, but I've been meaning to. Okay, uh, Upgrade is the movie you're looking for. It is Venom, but good. It is Logan Marshall Green, Tom Hardy's twin, uh, with an AI in his head that, that lets him be a superhero, more or less. And it even has the whole fight scene where he his body's kicking ass and his face is, is horrified. Except that it's an actual good movie. I, I I really want you to see Upgrade because I think it may scratch the itch for what you're looking for here. It's definitely on my list, so I, I will check it out. I, I just love Tom Hardy's choices as an actor. Like, there's one scene that like the character climbs into a a tank, a, a lobster tank, and from what I understand, that was just Tom Hardy that was written into the script. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just insane. Okay, let's uh let's move on to Star is Born. This is another film I saw. I saw this at my local AMC. I tried on Saturday. It was Saturday morning. I woke up, and uh, my my girlfriend Ketra said, "Let's go see a Star is Born." So we we go on our AMC A list app to go book tickets to Adobe Cinema because that's where you want to see. You know, you want to see it in a you know good sound and good presentation. And I know. 
you know, we're not living in middle of America or we're living in Los Angeles where it's a very high industry town and people tend to get excited for these Oscar films. But I was shocked to see that all the Dolby uh, screens around me, and there there are a bunch, were nearly sold out. If, if, if they had any seats, they were in the first row. So we had to... Uh, we had to go to a normal screening of Stars Born, which it's not bad. But um, uh, so uh, what did I think of Stars Born? You you can hear my full review on the slash filmcast. But just to give you the basics, I really liked the like first forty five minutes. I I thought were exceptional. I think it does uh, peak at that d- duet that we see in the trailers. I think uh, I wish the the rest of the movie was more her story than his story and uh, it seems like Bradley Cooper the director wanted to make it more about uh uh his story uh I uh I don't know I liked it I didn't love it I I do understand that this is probably going to win all the Oscars but uh I'm not uh glowing I I do like that song I do like uh I do think Cooper has some talent uh behind the camera I do think uh Lady Gaga was exceptional such a raw vulnerable natural performance and I I can't wait and I hope that she does more acting work uh now I I know a lot of people on this podcast uh saw this uh film everybody but Ben actually so uh let's start with Jacob Jacob what did you think I think it's a very good movie. I'm very much in like. I'm not in love. But for what it's worth, my wife texted me after she saw it um, out of town with some family, and she was inconsolable with tears <laughs> and <laughs> was bawling. So I think it's going to work for a lot of people, um, even though I feel like I can see the strings at times. I can see the, the the buttons that Bradley Cooper, as a director, was pushing very, very clearly. 100%. But he, he pushes them very well. I think. I think – I know Chris mentioned this before in his review on the site, and I agree – he is a visualist. I'm not impressed by him. I think that his he, he's a little bit too tight um, most of the time. He never lets us breathe a wide shot. I feel like he's very reliant on extreme close-ups. But in terms of getting performances out of himself, in terms of getting performances out of Lady Gaga, I think they're both phenomenal here. I think the portrait of this relationship where one person is fundamentally broken, the other person doesn't know how to live with that and has to learn how to live with that is really honest and sometimes moving and sad and, and oftentimes scary because that's what it is. Um, I do agree with you. The movie peaks with that first duet. The first 45 minutes when Bradley Cooper and the Gaga's characters meet and bond, and then he invites her up on stage, I was on board. I was loving it. I was deeply moved. And some people have argued that the um, movie's come down after that point that is intentional, that the movie's intentionally wanting you to feel the chase <laughs> for them to reclaim how good those early moments were. But even if that's intentional, it doesn't change the fact that the first half is much better than the second half. And it starts hitting some pretty predictable notes. It starts feeling a little, not quite sloppy, but a little more aimless than it was when it was a little more of a straightforward um, romance of the, of the first um, part. But it's it's good enough that when it wins all the Oscars, I won't be mad. It's it's a, it's a really good, well-made movie. And <laughs> Lady Gaga is just, she's so good. Her voice is so incredible. And there are complaints to be had. There are think pieces to be written. Uh, but I'll leave it here for now. It's a good movie. H.C., what did you think? I'm basically of the same opinion as uh, as you guys. I think that it peaks in the first hour, and I think that that duet scene between uh, Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga is the first like transcendent moment in that film that really becomes a classic piece of cinema. And the rest of the film is kind of spent chasing what that feeling uh, is meant to elicit, and it does work on a on a second. Um, metatextual level in that uh, this is about their relationship in that and um, they had something fleeting and beautiful for a little bit and they're just kind of trying to recapture it um, and but I, I agree also with Jacob in that it still kind of meanders a bit towards the end and uh, it becomes very lopsided in terms of the narrative weight uh, towards Bradley Cooper's character Jack's story versus Lady Gaga's story. And it seems like the movie doesn't seem to have a grasp on what it's trying to say about pop music and about artificiality. It kind of leaves the audience to come to their own conclusion, but it does feel a little bit like it's, um, you know, condemning um, this performative piece of music despite that performative um image that lady gaga's character has towards the end despite it really 
not having much to do with the overall story. So I, I liked it. I really enjoyed it. And um, I really love the first hour. Uh, I do understand the criticisms. And I kind of get also that we have had plenty and enough movies about the um, the pain of a of a white man. But I think that it's a really unflinching um, depiction of substance abuse and addiction that feels authentic. And I feel like Bradley Cooper especially has a, a heavy hand in that, having uh, struggled with substance abuse in his past as well. Chris, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, you know, I haven't seen this since TIFF, so it's not as fresh in my mind. But I agree with pretty much everything said here. I don't think... Uh, the second half is as meandering for me as it seems to be for everyone else. Um, uh, but I do agree that the second half is more concerned with Bradley Cooper's character than it is Lady Gaga's character. Like the first half is really all about her. And then the film sort of loses sight of her character a little bit towards the end when that sort of didn't work for me. But overall, this is a good movie. It's, it's nothing, um, you know, I said this before, but like, I don't think this is like the the masterpiece everyone is making it out to be. But it is very good, and I will not be surprised when it when it sweeps the Oscars, and I won't be, you know, angry about it either. I, I think it it earns pretty much everything it's trying to do. So uh, I liked it. Brad, do you have anything to add? Um, <clears throat> I pretty much land somewhere in the middle between like what Chris said and what uh, you guys said. Um, one of the things that I think that I would like to um, compliment though is aside from even though this does hit some cliche notes as far as the tragic showbiz romance is concerned and the you know the um, struggling with alcoholism and it you know breaking a relationship that was once so thriving and full of passion and love I think that it does it does some of those elements in a way that feels refreshing like I think there are scenes in this movie that haven't played out in this manner in these kinds of films before um, you know, n- not without spoiling anything, I, you know, obviously, you know, the movie's called The Star is Born, Lady Gaga, it becomes, you know, a, a figure in the spotlight in, in music, and there's a sequence involving uh, a certain late night comedy sketch show that I found very interesting because no one had ever really done, you know, like, that angle, you know, specifically as far as like a, a, a career musician is concerned. And I think that the it, it just added a, an element of realism, um, and it brought something fresh to the table that hadn't been seen before. And aside from I think the relationship between Gaga and Bradley Cooper, I also found myself uh, pretty well moved be- um, by the dynamic between Bradley Cooper and Sam Elliott. Uh, and I actually didn't realize until I saw the movie that they play brothers uh, in in the film. And that's an that's a, a, a strange um, dynamic at first. But the relationship they have, the struggles between them, and there's just like there's a couple scenes in particular where what they say to each other just really kind of like pulls at your heartstrings and like it hits you hard. Um, and I I thought that was uh, another good part of the movie. But yeah, I I honestly I, I liked it a lot. Um, there's definitely criticisms to be made for sure uh, as we've covered, but I think that overall it does a very good job with the story that Bradley Cooper wanted to tell. Okay, so what else have I been watching uh, this week? I, I went to the cast and crew premiere of Michael Giacchino's uh, theatrical directorial debut, Monster Challenge. Uh, it is a film that premiered at Fantastic Fest. It, uh, I was interested in this film because I'm a, a big fan of Giacchino's uh as a composer, and I know that when he first, uh, came, you know, tried to get into uh, the film industry, he wanted to be a filmmaker. So uh, I was interested to see what he had in his chops as a filmmaker. It's an, it's a very weird setup. Uh, Patton Oswalt is uh, is playing himself. He's uh, in Japan, and he somehow gets involved in one of these like wacky Japanese shows where you, like, do stunts, but he's dressed as a uh, giant kaiju, and he's battling another giant kaiju uh, in a uh, cardboard city. And uh, it's really, uh, you know, I don't want to reveal any more than that, but it is a wacky concept. It almost feels like something that, like, I'm I'm sure they probably were like, 
uh, you know, smoking some illicit substances or drinking or something. It came up with this, this crazy idea. And it, it's kind of that. It has a wonderful comic tone to it. Uh, it has insane production values. Huge stars. That you, uh, some big surprises there. Um, I'm not sure where this is going to show. Jacob, I know you saw this at Fantastic Fest. Uh, what did you think? Yeah, it's really fun, and it's not what I expected from Giacchino, whose scores are often so classy and classical. And dramatic. And <laughs> dramatic. They say you make this what's essentially a wacky stoner comedy. <laughs> it feels, when, when it eventually gets, ends up on YouTube, people are going to see this and love it. I can't, maybe Vimeo, I don't know. But it's a ton of fun. It's Giacchino and Patton Oswalt and a few other guest stars having a ton of goofy fun. Uh, I am concerned that maybe it leans a little too heavily into the into japan as wacky tropes but japan he japanese television is wacky and has some fun with that yeah. uh so i'll leave other people to make that criticism I, I i think it's very fun and very funny and if michael chikino wants to take a break from making great uh, film scores to make some really dumb comedies all power to him um, I also saw the documentary Deceptive Practice, The Mysteries and Mentors of Ricky Jay. Uh, this is a film that came out a few years ago. I just have not seen it until now. And this is about the uh, Ricky Jay is a magician, uh, which is interesting because I saw him as a kid and I've you know seen him over the years. But after one of my favorite movies of all time is uh, Magnolia the Paul Thomas Anderson movie. And he does the, the voiceover in that movie, the, uh, throughout the movie and like watching him in this documentary, it's, it's hard not to like, just think of Magnolia now. Like I, it's almost like the movie, uh, it, it's weird. It's like, he's saying different things than the movie. Um, <laughs> If, if that makes any sense. Uh, but it is interesting. I'm not sure if people that are not interested in magic would like this documentary. But I like the construct of it. It's less a documentary about uh, the man, Ricky Jay, and more about him through the through the shades of uh, the mentors that he had and the influences he had. And I almost wish there was, like, a docu-series that did this. That, like, you know, would do, like, a you know, each episode is, like, kind of a documentary on like, Oh, here's a documentary on, uh, Steve jobs or, you know, Bradley Cooper who or whoever. And it's not really doing like, you know, the regular biopic thing of him or like, you know, going through his life, but, uh, talking to the people that influenced him or learning about the people that influenced him and the people that he mentored to learn about the, the, the subject themselves. I think that's like actually an incredibly interesting concept. And I think, uh, because of that, I would recommend this to anybody who wants to see it. I think I found it on Amazon Prime uh, streaming, which is f for free for Amazon Prime members. So if you want to check that out, it's called Deceptive Practice. And uh, I also, um, you know, a lot of readers wrote, or readers and listeners wrote in and told me to ignore Chris and to give this Jack Ryan Amazon TV series a try. And one night we were bored, so we put it on, and, uh, you know, guys, I, 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 it's like a stupid man's homeland, um, <laughs> but it's incredibly binge-watchable. We watched, like, the whole eight episodes within, you know, a 20-hour period. We stayed up late one night, like, we couldn't stop. Uh, I actually really like it, and I'm excited for season two. It's not good. But it's it's a lot of fun, and uh, if is it if, the Cobra Kai of Jack Ryan adaptations, Peter? I don't even know. What, I don't even know what that means, Brad. What, is, <laughs> what, what does that even mean? Are you gonna uh, rewatch it all the time and talk about no, it? No, no, no. I'm not gonna rewatch it all the time. It's not that rewatchable. And I will say the first few episodes are not great. And I feel like people probably are gonna give up on it in the like first two episodes and be like, this isn't that good but uh it get it gets to be a lot of fun i don't know i i i highly recommend diving in and uh binging jack ryan uh, that's also another uh amazon uh prime watch show and uh last night the new star wars uh tv series star wars resistance uh premiered at 10 p.m because that's when kids watch their tv shows uh, I watched it. I stayed up late to watch it. And uh, I, I've talked in the past about hating the animation in the uh, the trailers for the show. I, I still hate the animation in the show. The show is really aimed at a, 
kid audience, probably more so than Star Wars Rebels. Uh, I really hate the main character cast. <laughs> uh, the alien character in the show is kind of fun and reminds me of something kind of inspired by Star Trek. And uh, this might be the first piece of Star Wars media to come out of the new Disney generation that I didn't really like. So uh, as a Star Wars fan, that's uh, I, I guess maybe I'm feeling like all these uh, Last Jedi <laughs> fan babies maybe not because they didn't ruin my star wars with the show but i don't know maybe, maybe this show just isn't for me uh I, I still have a lot to look forward to there's this john favreau show coming out so uh i don't know i i'm not I, I can't recommend star wars resistance at least based on the first episode uh let's move on to brad brad what have you been watching I caught up on some things last week. I finally got around to seeing A Simple Favor, uh, Paul Feig's uh, comedic thriller, and I liked it a lot. Um, it's very much in the vein of Gone Girl, but much funnier. Not in a way where like it's it's Paul Feig's goofy style co- of comedy, but in a way that just, just the, uh, Blake Lively and Anna Kendrick, their character interaction, and just how well they play their characters makes for just natural comedy. Um, not the kind of thing where it's, there's a lot of like jokes set up or, you know, physical comedy or anything like that. It's just comedy that kind of comes from, uh, life and also just the, the nerves of the, the thriller itself. Um, they're both fantastic in it. Uh, it, it obviously gets a little bit, uh, ludicrous in the end. Um, but it's, it's very entertaining. Definitely one of those, just like a, kind of like a, a trashy gossip kind of thriller, if you will. Um, and I, I, I liked it a lot. It made me want to see Paul Feig expand out and do some more uh, different stuff as opposed to the normal comedy that he usually does. Um, and then I also saw Hellfest uh, to kick off Halloween season, and I really enjoyed it. It's it's not necessarily the most um, original idea as far as, you know, slasher movies are concerned. Uh, the concept itself is is cool, um, but, you know, it's, it, it's a bonafide slasher movie and there are, i will say there are some particularly brutal kills in this one that kind of make you cringe and just like feel gross and like and like where you almost feel the pain um where there's stabbings and stuff um and i it that has the potential to become like one of those movies that sets off a chain of uh slashers and i, I hope that they continue to do it because they they did it in a um a cool way and uh, I'm kind of surprised that this idea hadn't played out like this before because it comes almost with like bonus fear from the movie itself because not only is the movie suspenseful and um, you know agonizing in that way, but it also makes you kind of scared to go to like haunted houses or festivals because there might be somebody there that is killing people. <laughs> um, I, I actually it, have a friend that doesn't go to haunted houses because of this fear. It's 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 after seeing this movie, it's a valid fear because I don't see how you don't get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so and then uh, after A Star Was Born, actually, my my girlfriend and I re- um, we both realized that we hadn't watched the Netflix documentary uh, Gaga Five Foot Two, and so we watched that over the weekend after we had seen, already seen A Star Was Born a few days earlier, uh, and it's a pretty good doc. It it played at TIFF in 2017. And it, it chronicles a year in her life. Um, it was around the time that uh, her uh, album Joanne was coming out. And all, she was also planning her Super Bowl performance. And what's actually kind of interesting, too, is uh, towards the beginning of the movie, she actually talks about just recently being uh, asked by Bradley Cooper to star in A Star is Born. Um, so that was just an interesting coincidence. Um, but it is uh, a fascinating, intimate eye-opening documentary that really shows you like the more tragic side of fame and like some just like the struggles that she has to deal with and like it's easy to disregard those kinds of things because oh she's a rich pop star like you know i wish i could have that kind of money you know and live that kind of life and you know i'm sure my problems will be Th- those you know, people as- obviously have not seen a stars born brad <laughs> right <laughs> um but yeah so it's just uh it's it was definitely an interesting glimpse into her life and who she is and how she approached her art and just how non-stop it is when you are as famous as that um and yeah it's, it's it was interesting so if you haven't seen it yet uh it's it's a breezy watch it's only like an hour and a half and it's on netflix very cool ben 
have you been watching anything? You've been traveling. How 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 do you even get a chance to watch stuff? I, I guess yeah, on the so, airplane. Yeah, on the plane. Yeah, I, I read The Princess Bride for a majority of one of the flights, and then uh, I tried to sleep through th- through some of it. And then um, one of the movies I watched was Incredibles two. I watched Wreck It Ralph also, but I don't need to talk about that because I love that movie. But uh, Incredibles two was one that I'd never seen before, and I, so I missed it in theaters. And I finally just got around to seeing it on the plane. Guys, I was I was really disappointed in this movie. I, I think I was shocked that like after whatever it had been fourteen years or something that this was the best that they could do. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just getting so spoiled by uh, the innovations of Pixar, but I, I just I found it kind of boring. Uh, I thought it was there was a lot of like. So the movie is not visually inventive in in really any way. I thought, and that that's one of the things, one of the sort of hallmarks of Pixar for me is like every time, even if I don't like something like like Brave, I thought that movie was just fine. Um, there were some visual aspects that made my jaw drop, and and I didn't get any of that here. There, for my money, there's like one good action scene in Incredibles two, and it's the the um, Elastic Girl on the bike, the the special motorcycle that she's made where she's like doing the uh trying to chase after the runaway train and other than that like there's nothing in this movie that i really enjoyed i i I was i was go go back to iceland or (laughs) like i i i mean i i just i found it to be um you know the the villain plot with which i won't give away in case other people haven't seen it i thought it was like you know you could see it coming from a mile away i thought that thematically the movie just didn't have very much to say beyond um very very basic observations about parenting which i you know at a certain point when you start to see movies and tv shows that are reinforcing um i guess tired notions of whatever story that they're trying to tell like in this case parenting where it's just like oh yeah the you know even though this baby is uh, has superpowers it, it, what you're what we're really trying to get at is the universality of how tough it is to be a parent um and and they're not really adding anything on top of that or 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 uh twisting that observation in any way or um uh, or subverting it i i just think like we're still doing this we're still making jokes about how tired parents are <laughs> you know I don't, I don't know i i just found it to be uh very lackluster all, all the way around even in the look of the movie i just wasn't impressed with it um i don't know i i could be wrong and obviously the movie is like i think the most successful animated film <laughs> of all time at the box office so uh, people a lot of people saw this i i just don't know um i don't know i, I was not a fan i, I was <laughs> also disappointed by it even though i it seems like i liked it more than you but I, I I don't know. It just didn't seem like the sequel that it was. It didn't even seem like it's a necessary sequel in any way. But uh, yeah, I, I, I man, I, I'm sure Brad and I will get into this uh, off mic at some point. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, not even worth my time. <laughs> I'm also then, just confused by your reaction, Ben, because it's the opposite of everything I thought about Incredibles 2. Really? So, wow. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I. I really liked Incredibles too, and I don't really understand where you go or you get the visually unappealing thing either, because I thought there were so many good sequences in that movie, not just the last girl bike scene, but the fight scene between that takes place with all the TV screens. That was really stunning and really interesting yeah, to me. Sure. Um, so I don't, I don't know where you're coming from, Ben. You're, just, I think you were asleep or something. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe the. Uh, I guess I have to uh, put in the caveat that maybe watching it on an airplane screen <laughs> didn't do it any favors. So maybe, uh, maybe I should give it another shot on a bigger screen and and uh, take a look. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that's where some of the visual, you know, the fact that I watch it on a three inch by three inch screen on the back of my plane seat uh, may have probably didn't do it any favors. Um, uh, and then also, just really quickly, I, I caught up with the premiere of The Good Place season three. My wife and I binged that show the first two seasons uh, not too long ago, and I love that show so much. And um, I, I still actually have one more episode on my DVR that I haven't caught up with yet. Um, but it, it's so good to have the show back. It's so funny, and so I, it loves its characters so much. And I love spending time with all of those actors, and especially in those roles. And uh, it's just a nice sort of warm blanket to come home to um, after being away for so long. Uh, what day of the week does Good Place a premiere on? Do you know? I actually Thursdays. don't even. Okay, yeah, there you go. I, I just set my DVR to record the new episode, so I haven't even been around for when the new episodes have aired. So, Jacob, yeah, it's very good this season. Yeah, and I hear, uh, I hear it's another twist for that show. But um, 
Jacob, uh, you didn't just watch Venom and A Star is Born. You watched a bunch of other stuff. Uh, tell us about it. Uh, yeah, first I noticed that Jigsaw was streaming on Amazon Prime, and I gave it a go, because the best way to watch a Saw movie is when it's streaming and you have nothing better to do. Um, I am actually a sort of fan of the Saw movies. They're not traditionally good, but I feel like, like any long-running horror series, once you get this many entries, they're worthy of study, they're worthy of somebody taking the plunge and trying to figure out what makes them tick, so it might as well be me. And Jigsaw, which came out last year, is an outlier in the Saw movies in that it came out six years after Saw 7, or Saw 3D, the final chapter, and it is a soft reboot, and it acknowledges the passage of time. It is shot in anamorphic 235, so it looks like a real movie. <laughs> it actually has this real Hollywood gloss to it, and it's shot by Michael Spierig and Peter Spierig, who are generally good directors. Uh, they made some, they've made movies I, I like. And it has a very different tone than the previous Saw movies overall. It's not as in-your-face gruesome. It's not as music video style. It is trying very hard to be respectable. And that's what makes it all the more hilarious when it ends up being just another Saw movie. And uh, what I love most of the Saw movies, the reason I keep coming back to them, is not for the crazy gore or the trashiness of it all, but because there's an attention to continuity and detail in these movies that is stunning. Like, Nothing that happens in part one is forgotten in part four. Things that happen in part two aren't impo- aren't important until part seven. It is just this um, in, in a genre where sequels tend to be the soft reboot every single time a new one comes out. I appreciate what Saw does, and Jigsaw picks up the torch. And when you th- and there are times where it looks like it is throwing continuity to the wind and re- and like really being a total reboot, and then it uh, in the end pulls stuff together and says, "Nope, this is just as ridiculous, soap operatic, and just as." just as much continuity as previous Saw movies. Um, if you flat out don't like these movies, all power to you, that's great. <laughs> they're, they're, they are trash. But this one is more trash, better made trash by filmmakers who are trying really hard to make it look respectable. And I had a really good time with it. Uh, but I was speaking to somebody who already knows how much I enjoy the previous uh, seven movies. Yeah. So take from that what you will. And, and I'm going to uh, disagree with you. The best way to watch the Saw movies is not at home on VOD, but uh, a few years back, they had all of them running. They were doing like these Saw marathons when a new one came out. I guess that probably stopped six years ago, not a few years ago. (laughs) Um, But uh, that was actually one of the funnest experiences I've ever had in the cinema, sitting in, because this this series almost plays like a binge-watchable TV show. And uh, you do gain a lot seeing each episode of this saga back to back and in the context of a theater where you can't like shut it off and you're like experiencing it with, you know, the same group of people throughout the entire franchise. Uh, it, it was actually a lot of fun, even though, yes, it's 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 very trashy. <laughs> uh, speaking of trash, <laughs> I'm going to talk about Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, a movie I've missed in theaters because I just couldn't bring myself to go to Jurassic, to another Jurassic World movie. But I really dislike this movie, guys. I, I found my complaints after the fact that I missed the conversation around it when it came out were not uncommon. Uh, but I was let down and disappointed and saddened by everything this movie did. And it's not like a Jurassic World situation where it was just a movie that I don't think was successful. I think there are large stretches of this film that are insulting and are doing their everything in their power to shit all over the iconography of Jurassic Park. I mean, at 45 minutes in the movie, there's an extended sequence that's in the old trailers where a volcano erupts. And we watch graphically as all the dinosaurs get killed by, by lava and those that don't jump in terror into the water and drown. And the entire movie, from that point on, is nonstop dinosaur suffering. There's even a shot of a Brachiosaurus on a burning dock being overtaken graphically by a volcano making the same desperate position we saw Brachiosaurus make in the first movie where it raises up on its hind legs, but it does it in a way where it's fearful instead of majestic. And I feel like it's just taking so much pleasure in tearing down things that mean something and things that were magical and things that were designed to leave us full of awe and wonder. And instead, it just reduces it to being, nope, this is something we're going to destroy in a big CGI action scene, and then have an auction for the back half of the movie. The world's most boring dinosaur auction. 
I despise this movie. I it left me sad and angry and, and, and in a rage. I don't get rageful at movies. I, when I see a bad movie, I try to sort of distance myself and, and try to dissect why didn't that work for me. I I'm glad I'm not, I'm not reviewing this movie. I'm glad it's the last I'll speak of it most likely because it left me shaken and angry in a way that these franchise movies do not. Uh, maybe this is how people who hate Last Jedi feel. I don't know, but I. I was going to say that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I take this away from Colin Trevorrow. Never hire Jay Bone and make anything fun again because clearly he doesn't know what fun is. I, I, I know Peter. You're one of the people who like this movie. Um, well, no, I, and, I like the first half of the movie. The second half of the movie, I, I really feel like is insulting. <laughs> it, it insults me in every possible way. But yeah. I was, I, I mean, Peter. I, I, I'm try. I try to like not let my emotions get the better of me when talking movies. I feel like that's sometimes a, a, a trap we fall into as writers and critics, and we let our emotions dictate how we examine art. Yeah. But I, I, I can't take like, I this movie hurt me in a way that movies don't hurt me before, and I feel like there's just, I, I don't want to see a dinosaur die painfully as as the big CGI money shot, and not not in a franchise where the dinosaurs were made to be things that we love. And I, I, hope, I hope I'm making sense here. I hope everybody else understands what I'm saying here. But I... Yeah. <laughs> I'm just I'm not be really, really in a foul mood. But I did <laughs> also watch uh, American Vandal Season 2, which is really funny and really good and a really great mystery. And I love that this fake documentary series about poop and dicks has become this really incisive and brilliant deconstruction of youth in 2018. So go watch American Vandal Season 1 and 2 instead of Jurassic World 2. Okay, uh, let's move on to Chris. What have you been watching? Uh, I just want to say I agree uh, with Jacob on Jurassic World. I won't I won't launch into this too much because I wrote a huge spoiler review about it. But yes, fuck that movie. It's garbage. And uh, people got very angry at me. I remember my review and I, I called it bad. And I really can't imagine why anyone would like that movie. It's just it's needlessly nasty and it has nothing to do with what made you know that franchise magical to begin with that said um i, I watched a bunch of stuff i'm gonna i'm gonna burn through it really quick because i don't want to take up so much time but oh, wait, first wait, off, wait, wait wait actually i hate to interrupt you chris but i just realized oh. that ht also saw jurassic world fallen kingdom <laughs> so we may as well get her her reaction to this before we move on <laughs> ht what did you think so i had the opposite reaction of both Jacob and Chris, which I'm very shocked at because I absolutely hated Jurassic World. But I was pleasantly surprised by Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. I also watched it on a plane and um, I wasn't <laughs> expecting much out of it. But I I was surprised by how uh, visually stunning it was, how beautiful the film was visually. Um, and I think this might be because I don't have the emotional ties that everyone has to the Jurassic Park franchise. I've only really seen the first Jurassic Park film in full, as well as Jurassic World. Uh, I really like what Jurassic Park did as a film, as both a just kind of magical dinosaur film, as well as a, a horror film. And I think that Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom taps into the horror part of that of the franchise well. Um, but I think that it's also J.A. Bayona not really caring about the franchise and just kind of using it to do a good horror movie, uh, which I think he pulls off excellently and um, uh, accomplishes some great, really dread-inducing moments. But yeah, I, I don't really see it even as like a Jurassic Park film. It just kind of feels like the the dinosaurs are secondary to what J.A. Bayona wants to do. But I will say that yeah. didn't offend me as much as Jurassic World did, which I absolutely despise. So because of that, I will say I like this film. I didn't love it, but I was pleasantly surprised by it. And I'm very sorry that uh, it hurt you so much, Jacob and Chris. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, H.T. eats dinosaurs for breakfast. So <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm a heartless meat-eating person so <laughs> okay chris uh what movies did you watch <laughs> okay um uh first i watched the upcoming netflix movie apostle which is pretty good it's too long it's about 10 or 20 minutes too long but when it works it works really well it's you know it's a lot like the wicker man it's a lot like uh 
the Ben Wheatley movie that's name I can't remember all of a sudden. Kill List. Kill list. Yes, it's a lot like that. Uh, it, it has that same sort of tone, and you know, it, when it when it works, it works really well. It, it's nasty, it's uh, creepy, but like I said, it's probably like ten. 15 minutes too long. Um, next up, I watched Satan Slaves, which is now streaming on Shudder. It's a Indonesian horror film. It's it's very similar to um, Hereditary in that it's about this uh, this grandmother who dies and creepy stuff starts happening to her family. Um, it's very good. I don't want to give them a lot away because this is one of those movies, the less you know, the better it is. But uh, if you're looking for... Uh, you know, I, I'm a big horror fan, but I admit that one of my horror blind spots is like foreign horror films. Like other than, you know, Italian giallo films, I don't really, I'm not really as well versed at, on foreign horror as I wish I were. So I, I try to watch more as much as I can. And this is a great example of that. So if you're trying to expand your horror horizons, I would uh, recommend checking this out. Um, another horror movie I watched is Malevolent, which is now streaming on Netflix. This starts off really promising. It's about this team of uh, con artists who pretend to be ghost hunters. Like um, uh, the, the 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 main person in the group is played by Florence Pugh, and um, she she pretends to be a, a psychic medium. And you know, they basically they go to places where people, you know, people's loved ones have died and they pretty much prey on their grief for money. But then they get invited to this uh, giant rundown orphanage and uh, creepy stuff starts happening for real to them there. And, you know, the first half of this movie is really cool because it plays out like this supernatural thriller, but then it descends into uh, torture porn territory, which I really don't care for so this is half of a good movie if you're looking for an atmospherically creepy film you might enjoy this but don't um don't expect too much uh and finally i watched the upcoming netflix series the chilling adventures of sabrina and i'm technically embargoed from giving a full review for this but look for it on slash film.com but uh this this um you know if you if you liked the trailers for this film you I think you'll like the show because the trailers are a good representation of what the show ends up being it's definitely not you know if you're expecting you know the sitcom Sabrina the Teenage Witch with Melissa Joan Hart this is the complete <laughs> opposite of that so please don't expect that but otherwise um it was interesting i look forward to sharing my review soon later this month Hey, Chris, I just want to point out that your criticism of Apostle is the exact same thing every Fantastic Fest uh, said. So it's I feel like that's going to be the ongoing thing forward. Like, I want to see the 100-minute cut of Apostle. I feel like there's, a, there's something great hidden in there. Yeah, I, I want him to make more horror films because uh, he, he's, he's clearly got a great eye for that. But, yeah, I just wish this were like 10 or 15 minutes shorter. So HD, uh, Beyond, A Star's Born, Jurassic World, Fallen Kingdom – what have you been watching this week? So New Zealand Air has a really great selection of uh, both movies and TV shows. And I end up watching several episodes of Killing Eve, which is the BBC America um, spy drama starring Sandra Oh and Jodie Comer. And I really enjoyed it. This is a show I've been meaning to get on to ever since uh, Sandra Oh got nominated for an Emmy for her role. I wanted to support the fellow Asian Americans, of course. And she is really good in this series. She plays a sort of desk jockey MI5 off- officer who is obsessed with female st- serial killers and kind of starts to get on the trail of this one psychopathic assassin um, who is played by Jodie Comer. And um, it's very it's very intriguing, very well done. It kind of does feel a little bit like a BBC drama. I don't really know how to describe exactly how it is, but it feels kind of small. But the character development and the performances by both O and Comer are so good. I think Jodie Comer especially is a breakout role in this. She plays um, the Linnell, the psychopath, with such um, nuance, I guess you would say. She gives, she has a lot of layers to like the typical psychopath and she does, she has such fun with it. I really enjoy it. It's such a fun like, cat, cat and mouse game especially led with two uh really strong female characters so uh, i recommend it i'm excited to see more of the episodes after i kind of get out of the doctor who bubble that i'm in which 
speaking of, is the other thing I watched. So, as you may know, I have been binging uh, Doctor Who in a rewatch up until the season 11 premiere, which took place Sunday night. Um, I watched it twice because it was simulcast first at 1.45 p.m. Eastern time in um, conjunction with the British airtime of the show. And then I watched it again uh, at, at prime time around eight. And I enjoyed it both times. It's uh, the premiere episode of season 11, and it's the debut of Jodie Whittaker as the first female doctor. I've been waiting for this moment for so long, and it lived up to my expectations and more. So the episode is uh, a little bit kind, kind of a slow start. Uh, it takes its time introducing the human companions or in this case friends because uh the bbc is trying is starting to rebuild um the human characters on this show as as friends instead of companions it's kind of something that's a little bit out of show um they've been the female often female companions of the of the doctor are kind of what you would consider like the nerdy Bond girls and they're always called companions, but only out of show, not really in show, but here they're called friends because it's all like a big happy family. <laughs> and uh, um, there's a really great chemistry with the doctor and the, and her new friends. Um, but once Jodie Whittaker's doctor just crashes into frame, literally uh, it really takes off. She is sublime in the role. She's everything I want in a doctor. She's funny. She's physical. She's a little bit ruthless. And um, she really delivers on this kind of quirky, eccentric character that has been played by so many men up until now and played differently by all of the men. Uh, you can categorize everyone with like a, as a different character, really. And uh, I've, I'm so excited to see what she does with the role. I will say that the episode itself just didn't feel like it lives up to her performance in a way. It was, like I said, a little slow, a little moody. It kind of felt like uh, it played out kind of like a crime drama in a way, which almost made sense considering new showrunner Chris Chibnall's um, uh, experience as a writer for Broadchurch. And so I don't know how I feel about that. I do like that it's more character driven and it's not as fantastical and convoluted as the previous era under Stephen Moffat was. But I am excited to see where they go with this. Well, I'm, I'm actually interested in checking out this new season of Doctor Who and giving the show another chance. Um, let's move on to what we've been eating. Bread. You're always eating uh, some some strange seasonal stuff. What have you been eating this week? Uh, nothing too crazy this week. Just some new stuff that I tried. Um, Mountain Dew just recently came out with a new flavor of their ice variant on Mountain Dew, which is kind of like their Sprite Sierra Mist version of, of Mountain Dew. Um, I wasn't, I didn't love the regular Mountain Dew ice they came out with. It was, it was fine. It's pretty sweet, um, and it's not as good as regular Mountain Dew. But they just came out with a new cherry flavored Mountain Dew ice. And I like it better than the regular one. It's uh, it's definitely very, very sweet. Um, it tastes a lot like a white cherry icy. Um, so it's it's best consumed, I think, probably in smaller doses. Um, if they make it in cans, it would probably be better. Uh, I found a, just a regular size bottle uh, when I was checking out at, at Walmart recently. Um, so it's, it's pretty good uh, if you're looking for something new to change up your soft drink routine, I guess. Um, and then I also recently tried these new oat crunch cinnamon Cheerios, um, which are pretty good. They they're kind of, I guess that you could kind of say they're like cinnamon toast crunch Cheerios. They're not quite as sweet or sugary, um, but they're they're very cr crunchy. The oats add uh, a good crunch to it, and the, the cinnamon has a nice flavor. And so they're uh, it's pretty good cereal as far as if you're looking for like you know a more adult tasty cereal as as opposed to like something that has a bunch of marshmallows or bright colors and, and sugar in it cool let's move on to what we've been playing jacob uh you've been playing a few things this week uh yes i finally broke free of dead cells on the nintendo switch because i said i want to wean myself off it before red Dead redemption 2 arrives later this month so i'm playing a handful of smaller games i first i want to talk about into the breach a puzzle strategy game uh, from Subset Games, who made uh, FTL, Faster Than Light, which is an incredible game uh, I played constantly uh, for years, even like, on various different platforms. Into the Breach may be better. The basic gist here is this sort of pixel art game, is that it's a post-apocalypse, 
Earth is flooded except for a few islands, and there are giant monsters rising from the Earth to destroy the last remnants of humanity. So you have to control a small army of giant robots to punch and shoot the uh, monsters to oblivion and save the Earth. But the uh, gist here, the, the gimmick that makes it really amazing, is it, even though the game itself, the actual mechanics of making choices and making strategic decisions of where to place your troops is very fun, is that you will die frequently and constantly. The, the world will fail all the time. Uh, but whenever you fail, you have enough energy to send one of your soldiers back in time to start the war and start over again. So you, so you can like sort of level up your soldiers and try to um, make their mechs better. But when it all goes plumbing down, you can you have to make a choice. Okay, which one of my guys do I send back in time? And so that means like I have one guy who's more powerful than others because he's been sent back in time five or six times, and the, the war always fails. He keeps his upgrades. He goes back in time. I start over again. And each level, you can play it in three to five minutes. It's great pick-up and go. It's a really fun, great puzzle game. It has just enough of that sci-fi, time-travel, monsters versus robot hook to uh, keep me dramatically invested, e- even as I am more closely drawn to the puzzles uh, at this point. I've also been playing The Bridge, which is a game about five years old, but it's on Nintendo Switch now. It is essentially uh, if M.C. Escher made a puzzle game. It is uh, black and white and... You can control this little character as he moves through these series of ex- of extremely complex, convoluted, strange, hand-drawn worlds where you can rotate gravity left or right to change the entire environment. And so a, a, a wall becomes a floor. The ceiling becomes uh, the floor as you rotate more and more around. So you have to try to navigate these worlds, these locations, by shifting perspective. And it's only a few bucks. And I know it's available on other platforms, like maybe even on mobile, but I'm really enjoying it on the Switch. Uh, and finally, I went ahead and bought the uh, Crash Bandicoot Remastered Trilogy for the Switch. This is also available on Xbox and on PlayStation 4. And these are the uh, original trilogy of games made by Naughty Dog back before they made The Last of Us and Uncharted and all those. Uh, and these are games I grew up playing. I know a lot of kids grew up with Mario. I grew up with Crash Bandicoot. He was very much my guy. Uh, my family, my mom and sister, don't even play video games. Even they played Crash Bandicoot with me. <laughs> so it's very much a nostalgia trip. It's very much a I'm going to spend 40 bucks to get these three games of my childhood that mattered a lot to me back then. And I'm pleased to report they, they hold up well. The, the remasters look great. They're more of a they're actually, they're remakes, actually, not remasters. They, they've, it's a completely new graphical engine. But I feel like they did a really fine job of maintaining the style and color and energy and controls of the old games. So if you're nostalgic for these games, uh, they, they hold up. They're still tough. They're still funny. They still have a ton of charm. And maybe they're not as smooth as modern platformers. Like Super Mario Odyssey last year was a game that handles like a dream, whereas Crash is a little clunky. It feels, it feels like a series from the 90s uh, in many ways. But I do not regret spending the money. It's I'm, I'm having a great time reliving those games. Brad, uh, you've been playing Mario Party 11. This is a game I used to play a lot uh, back in the day, uh, or, you know, an earlier version of this game. So uh, tell us about the new one. Yeah, we had a, a family birthday celebration over the weekend, And my cousin uh, has a Nintendo Switch, and he bought Mario Party 11, and we spent a good couple hours uh, playing it. And it's pretty fun. It's actually been a while since I had played a Mario Party game, Um, probably since, I don't know, maybe the GameCube was probably the last time I played Mario Party. Um, And it's just just a fun game to play with a a bunch of people. Um, you know, it's one part, you know, uh, a Nintendo board game, basically you're trying to get stars. And then another part is the mini games that come between those rounds. Uh, and it was pretty fun. And (laughs) what's kind of interesting is the way like the game plays out is the outcome can really be changed dramatically by the very end of the game. Because, uh, in both times I played, um, the first time it was just me and my, my, my cousin Cameron, um and we were playing and i was i had lost a star and i was down by two but i had the most coins out of the entire group and at the very end of the thing it awards bonus stars and you need the most stars to win after that it's most coins and so uh they handed out a bonus star for who won the most mini games and a bonus star for who landed on the most unluckiest or red spaces where you lose coins and I won both of them, so I ended up winning the game at the very end after playing, and he was so mad. 
Oh, anger. Classic Mario Party emotion. <laughs> Brad, I have one question. Is this the game where the trailers for the Mario game came out and Luigi died? That the, I don't that was, know. That was Super Smash Brothers. That was a new Smash yeah. Brothers. That was Super Smash Brothers. Sorry. I, yeah. I remember everyone, that trailer came out and everyone was crying. <laughs> Luigi was dead. Oh, I, I do I do associate Mario Party with lots of crying and rage, though. So. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's very fun. The, the mini games are really cool, and um, it's there's a nice variance between like the the different things you have to do with the the Switch controller, and so it's it's definitely a fun fun party game to play with friends. Well, very cool. Uh, we have officially, I think, gone the longest episode of Slash Film Daily in the history of this podcast. So we're going to cut it off here. Uh, you can find more of all of our work on SlashFilm.com. This podcast, Slash Film Daily, is published every weekday on iTunes, Google Play, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. Please feel free to send us your feedback, questions, comments, concerns to us at peter at slashfilm.com. That's peter at slashfilm.com. And please rate and review this podcast on iTunes. Tell your friends, spread the word, and we'll see you tomorrow. Hey, Peter, we, we, have, we have to do something very important. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, we're going long, Jacob. Okay, go, go for it. All right, I'll open up to a random page. This is the chapter on liars. <laughs> For those of you who are following along, this is the gargantuan book of insults, offense, and effrontery. And um, I still here's... have not gotten one email telling me if they <laughs> like this or dislike this. We get emails telling us that they like or dislike almost anything, but I have not heard from one person about this. Okay, go go ahead. Oh, Jacob. This is for us, not for them, Peter. <laughs> uh, this section on liars is unique in that it gives you the the, the punchline, it gives you the insult, and then it, it, it gives you the context. So you, the, it, the joke won't make sense until I tell you the context after the fact. Are you guys ready for this? Yeah. Okay, Chris, uh, I hear yes. you. Dab- I hear you dabble in oils because you're a gas station attendant. Oh. That's not funny at all. <laughs> Wait, why are you guys laughing at that one? That one is <laughs> even. Funny. It's just, it's, so it's just so bad. <laughs> Hey, Peter, uh, I hear your brother occupied a chair of applied electricity in a famous public institution uh, because he was he was executed at Sing Sing. That's, that's so <laughs> disturbing. It's not really... Oh, my God. <laughs> your, your brother was murdered. <laughs> <laughs> Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! <laughs> 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 Your brother was murdered. Uh, uh, hey, HT, I hear the gowns you wear come from Paris. Paris, Kentucky... Oh. oh boy! Wow. Hey, maybe there's some great seamstresses in Paris, Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs>